Wood Shake and Warfighter Nation. Ron here with Warfighter Ranch and Isaiah 68. Happy Red Friday. Don't forget to remember everyone deployed, including Jesus, who deployed after the original Red Friday. I bet you didn't know that one of the OG Romani bros is an Iraqi man. steeped in history it is the site of the garden of eden of the great flood it is the birthplace of abraham you tread you tread lightly there with another Ramadi Bros story. This is the Terp War of 2004. Patriotism comes in many forms. And when you're in a foxhole with faith as your sole option, does it really matter where the one on your left or right was born? It shouldn't. And it never really did for me. This is the untold story of the great or not so great Terp War of 2004 that suddenly raged through the base camps and Iraqi neighborhoods of the Sunni Triangle like the great or not so great Chicago Fire. In the Arab Spring of 2004, the war in Iraq was more than bombs and bullets, but a war where modern intelligence met age-old loyalties. To the average Joe, it was about hunting down terrorists in the post 9-11 world. It was just after the invasion, the U.S. forces were starting to establish a firm footprint with a multinational coalition of forces. The Allied war effort relied heavily on interpreters, both from the U.S. and local. Our battalion had two such interpreters, both men, one from New York via Pakistan and the other a local Iraqi man. The Pakistani man, named Salah, owned an import-export business out of New York and was incredibly well-connected. He not only lived the language and culture, but he could get you anything you wanted, even in a town like Ramadi. He had a secret security clearance, and as a Cat 1 interpreter with American citizenship, he earned a salary of nearly $80,000 a year plus bonuses. Not bad for taking a big risk and speaking the mother tongue. The other man, named Sam, was local. Well, kinda. He lived with his wife and five children in Baghdad. And every day, Sam would have to get up before the morning call to prayer and basically start hitchhiking towards Camp Junction City out in Ramadi. This may sound simple, but interpreters, or terps, as we called them, were open targets of opportunity for our enemies, and many died in the service of our allies during Operation Iraqi Freedom. And to give you just a bit of an idea how far it is from Baghdad to Ramadi every day, the distance Sam would have to hitchhike, here's a little screen grab from Google Maps. Now we were the enemy. They were supposed to try and kill us. I get that. But Sam and guys like him, they had a special kind of hatred for. A hatred the insurgency considered a betrayal to their people, their culture, and even their God. These are the ones who see themselves as those who carry Allah's sword to exact his revenge. These are the guys who are friends of making home movies of their work and posting them on YouTube so the families can be traumatized forever. That's what kind of guys these guys are. Those are the kind of people our enemies are. And I realize for some of you that was a bit intense. 
that that level of evil, I assure you, still exists out there. Now, conversely, as a Cat 2 local interpreter, Sam made about 200 bucks a month, plus food, body armor, and temporary protection when he was out with us. Or was it the other way around? The heat eventually became too difficult for Sam to travel daily, you think? And he was moved into our building on Camp Junction City in the interim. His room was bare for the most part. An army cot, a prayer rug, and a couple of bricks to hold up a tea kettle for a small fire on the floor was all that he really required. He was a very simple man, and much had been taken away from him over the years. Still, he was a proud Iraqi man, and even prouder to have a room in the barracks with the boys. This brewed something within Sam, and I sensed it as something familiar to me as well. In speaking with him, I learned that Sam was a former paratrooper in the Iraqi army many moons before. Even when they had paratroopers, I guess. Sam then went on to become a teacher after his service was over. I was a paratrooper, and I would later go on to become an instructor for Homeland Security after my time in the Army, even though it was unbeknownst to me at the time. Sam was married with five children, as was I. Sam had four sons and a daughter, with his daughter being the baby. We have four sons and a daughter, and as you know, Abby is our baby. As you can see, Sam and I had a lot in common, including a goal to bring each other home alive after every mission. So I get this package one day from Helen and the kids that included a small bracelet made with colorful beads and a note explaining that Abby had made it for Sam's daughter, whom I had told Helen and the kids about. I certainly never asked her to, and neither did Helen. And five years later, I would start tying knots and never stop, but that's besides the point. But there it was. The sweetest, most innocent little thing in the world, and arguably one of the most dangerous places in the world at the time. It's not always the blood and bullets that messes you up. Sometimes it's life's little juxtapositions that you get to bear witness to. Sometimes love and its infinite simplicity from a child showers light into a very dark place. Yes, I'm certain I've heard that somewhere before. On a scheduled R&R &R trip about a week later, Sam found his way back to Baghdad and his family for a few days. I actually felt bad about not having anything for the other four children, but I was a bit curious to see what his wife and daughter's reaction would be. So a few days later, Sam shows back up again and runs upstairs and knocks on our door. Mista Sergeant Breland! <laughs> I just can't. You know what I mean. So Sam asked me to come downstairs in a little bit and have some coffee with him. You know that really strong Turkish stuff that puts puts the Italian stuff to shame? Sorry, not sorry, Italy. You already have good food and sports cars. You can't have everything. So after everyone beds down for the night, I headed downstairs and knocked on Sam's door. Come, 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 Mr. Sergeant Breland, come, come in. I walked into his dimly lit room where he offered me more coffee and, as always, another cigarette. We smoked a lot, especially after we got back from outside the wire, refitted our vehicles, and then geared down. Sam was always grateful when, when returning back to camp, and I would often see him praying with his beads in hand and his kit still on. He was a truly devout man, and definitely one hell of an interpreter. And we use that term very specifically, because if all he were to do were to translate the language, then I probably wouldn't be alive today. True interpretation is a gift. Throughout Islamic culture, it's usually a very big deal to greet one another, and it takes a minute sometimes. Americans aren't used to this when a different language is being spoken, and they don't understand it. Everyone's on pins and needles until the interpreter speaks. And it is in these moments that you realize what a valuable asset this interpreter really is. If we were going into a situation that was already established, like a house, a raid or something, where they needed perimeter support at night or something, we would chat with Sam about it beforehand so he was in the loop before we went in. I remember going to this one house one night about 0300 
The current law at the time, or at least the guidance from the Allied Coalition, stated that every house was allowed to have one AK for home protection. We're an occupying army, but we're not savages, because of course we believe in the Second Amendment. But at the same time, there are those who would take advantage of that. And this was one of those times. After finding rifles, grenades, mines hidden in the walls, recoilless rifles, IEDs of all kinds, wiring, parts and components all throughout the house. We were questioning a guy, and he was evading this questioning pretty aggressively. But Sam was the kind of guy you really wanted in this situation. There were two kinds of greetings, hugs or kisses on the cheek. I literally told Sam to tell them exactly what I say, and nothing more, nothing less. Sam was really great about sticking straight to this point because I explained my perspective and he explained their new perspective. It worked out very well. So we're talking to this guy and I literally told Sam to tell him exactly this. If he doesn't answer my question, I'm going to shoot him in the face. I didn't raise my voice. I didn't flinch. I didn't move a muscle. I simply spoke the words and Sam told them exactly that. I also told them that I'd been there a long time and I really, really wanted to go home and that I would kill as many people as I had to in order to make that happen. When Sam told me that, I said, damn, brother, you're laying it down a little thick, aren't you? And his answer struck me like a knife in the chest. Sam said, is it not true? Fair point. But we're going to talk about that one over coffee and smokes later. In our conversations regarding the topic of faith, he would tell me how Allah even loved me. And I would gently remind him that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died for us, whereas his deity required him dying for it. All I can hope is that it planted a seed. We solved a lot of the world's problems together, Sam and I. There's really nothing like two men from opposing faiths in different countries coming together honestly with open hearts and minds over coffee and smokes in a combat zone. I'll tell you what, in friendship born out of the ashes of war, and it taught me a lot. God used it to crack the shell of my internal combat prejudices developed through three combat engagements with primarily Islamic opposition. I have to say, it was pretty ingrained to me at that point, but God used Sam to show me there was hope, even in a place like this. He wasn't just an outstanding interpreter, but a genuinely good man, a good husband and father, and if I'm being honest, a damn good citizen. At the end of our year-long tour, I actually called him my friend, even though he did it every single day. It was just a part of their everyday vernacular. Hello, my friend. Yes, my friend. Hello, Mr. Sergeant Breeden, my friend. You get it. Just before the end of our tour, Sam was transferred over to the Iraqi Civil Defense Corps, ICDC, basic training classes, where the last time I saw him, he was in woodland camo and yelling to new trainees to get off the bus with a sharp knife hand. I could not have been more proud. Now, Salah... The other interpreter, the one with the security clearance and high salary, he wound up programming a Garmin GPS handheld radio unit out in Ramadi and was found to be calling in mortar fire from within our own camp. He had been stepping off positions for weeks. He was later killed by a human team leader in 2004 after hiding out in a box truck and shooting at U.S. forces out the back before eating a 40 mic mic grenade out of an allied Mark 19 because that's what happens. Two very different men, two different backgrounds, but only one loved the country we were serving in, and it was the one who called it home. So never judge a book by its cover because you just never know the man behind it until you do. That's it for this message. You've got your spiritual chow. Pass it on to the next troop, next mission, time now. See ya on the other side. Do not get off on a
exit two two over.